Okay, should we start, Professor Tonmoy? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Department of English, Midnapur College, a very warm welcome to all of you to this online lecture series. Today, we are extremely glad and honored to have with us Dr. Jolly Dash as our speaker. Uh, so, before handing over the session to Dr. Jolly Dash, I would like to formally introduce uh, her to all our participants. Uh, Dr. Jolly Dash is an associate professor and head of the Department of English at Vidyashagar University. She has completed her PhD in the year 2004. Her research interests include modern British drama, Indian theater, tribal literature and culture, Loreto education, Indian uh, English literature, diasporic literature, the social relevance of the cult of Manasa, and uh, photo narration of Adivashi life. Uh, uh, several of her essays uh, has also been published in many reputed uh, national and international journals. She has also written several books entitled Ethnic Tapestry, Bengali Short Stories on Indigenous People, published by the Center of Excellence in the year 2019, Tracing Karnad's Theatrical Trajectory in 2015, and Iliad's Prismatic Plays, A Multiplex uh, Quest in 2007. She is also a member of several learned societies, including the English uh, Studies Association, Godhuli Moon Chandonagor, and uh, Vishya Bharati. She, is also, uh, she has also acted as a convener and, uh, of numerous conferences, seminars, and workshops. And uh, today, she is going to speak on the topic, uh, 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 Karnat's adoption of the Bhagavata in traditional Indian theater. And uh, I would also like to add that uh, uh, you can write your questions in the comment section. And uh, towards the end of the lecture, we are going to discuss the questions. So without further ado, uh, I would like to request our eminent speaker, Dr. Jolly Dash, to please deliver her lecture. Over to you, uh, Thank you, Shongita, for an introduction which I don't think I deserve. Uh, to all the participants here, I wish a very good evening and the online lecture series organized by the Department of English Midnapur College has already become very popular for which we are also proud because we belong to Midnapur. I especially thank Mr. Tonmoy Kundu, Assistant Professor and Head of the Department of English Midnapur College for inviting me to share my views on Karnad's adoption of the Bhagavata from traditional Indian theater. I also extend my gratitude to the other esteemed teachers in this very famous and erudite department of English in the Midnapur College, Sri Rajendranath Dotto, Sheikh Sagi Ali, Dr. Shoikat Sharkar, Sri Sanjay Soren, and of course, Srimoti Shongita Konar, who has just introduced me. I would also like to offer a very special thanks to the principal of the college, Dr. Gopal Chandra Bera. Girish Karnad, who was endowed with the honorary DLIT in 2010 by Vidyashagar University, passed away last year on the 10th of June, leaving behind him the plays he has written in Kannada and in English, his loved Ranga Shankara, the theater built in memory of his friend, the actor Shankar Nag, who died in a car accident, his outspokenness about various issues, and his charming, humble personality. The charm of linguistic communication lies in its magnetic narration. Listeners are mesmerized by attractive verbal delivery. This Karnad had not just realized very early in his life, he had also imbibed it so much that it turned out to be the cornerstone of his linguistic karishma. Today, I shall invite you all to take a look at how Karnad adopts in his own theatrical creativity, the Bhagavata who hails from Indian folk theater, 
not just as a character in his plays, but as a narrator par excellence. For this purpose, I have spread out my discussion in the following way. There are four sections. First, we shall try to see who a Bhagavata is, that is, the origin of the Bhagavata and his role in our performance. Second, we will take a look at Kannad's interface with this character of the Bhagavata. Third, we shall take a panoramic view of the use of the Bhagavata as well as modified forms of the Bhagavata in Karnad's plays, for which there will be illustrations from the texts. Finally, there will be a very brief conclusion. So to turn to the first of these four sections, the Bhagavata. The Bhagavata is an avatar of the Sutradhar or Sutradhara found in ancient Sanskrit drama with which the Sutradhara is intrinsically connected. The first person to appear on the stage for the performance of a play was the Sutradhara, who laid the foundation of the theatrical performance by performing the ritual worship of either one god or many gods. In certain very ancient Sanskrit plays, there is this practice of worshipping all the three deities of the trinity that is Shiva, Brahma and Vishnu. Later on, of course, it became only the worship of Ganesha. So that again is a different uh, story altogether, which we will leave out for the present time. The Sutradhara then narrated in brief the story of the play which was going to be performed and gave information about the playwright, time and place of performance and other issues allied to the performance. But gradually, his role was distributed among other performers. This is also what Kannad does. Curbing much of the control he exercised over the performance. In folk theatre, however, the Sutradhara, called the Bhagavata, retains his original function as narrator. Traditionally, the Bhagavata opens the play with the offering of worship to Lord Ganesha, accompanied by gestures indicating ritual worship. Now, let us take a look at the Bhagavata in Yakshagana. The Bhagavata appears in other folk forms of theatre as well. But we will take a look at Yakshagana, since Karnad was strongly influenced by this form of theatre, which is generally ascribed the status of folk theatre. According to some scholars, Yakshagana was initially known as Bhagavata Atta. The Bhagavata, who is the leader of the chorus, holds a pivotal position in the Yakshagana performance. It is he who presents the Yakshagana prasanga or the story with the help of actors who are completely under his control, like stringed puppets, as though he holds the strings which control them. Therefore, he was the Sutradhara in a very literal sense. Because of his importance, in the Yakshagana parlance, he is called the Prathama Vesha, the first actor or the first character. There is yet another form of dramatic narration, which is the Tal Maddale of Karnataka. This narrative drama is probably the predecessor of the Yakshagana, a colorful dance drama of the region. Tal is a kind of symbol and Maddale is a kind of drum. The name of this narrative form is derived from these two musical instruments, which are used by the performers. The chief narrator of the Tal Maddale is called Bhagavata and his associates are known as Artha Dharis because they then dharan or bear, contain, carry forth the meaning of what the Bhagavata will say and explicitly act out these roles by way of their oral singing and oral dialogue. 
they do not dance or move about on the stage they are seated and they shift roles among themselves depending on the requirement of the performance but as time passes the arthadharis then become veshdharis and they no longer sit they begin to dance and fight battles and move about on the stage and that shift is then in the form of the yaksha gana the bhagavata performs manifold functions he is usually the actor manager of the troop of performers so this actor manager we will find in the fire and the rain next the bhagavata commences the show by offering prayers to the deities usually it is lord ganesha who is worshiped we see ganesha in hayavadana the bhagavata along with his chorus of musicians and singers sits in a convenient place in the acting space he introduces the story and the characters then he starts narrating the story in verse and he also enters into conversation with the different characters as well as the jester he remains present on the stage throughout the performance conducting it as a grand master of the orchestra all these characteristics are available in the bhagavata in hayavadana in tal maddale the arthadharis assume different roles in the story as i told you and taking the cue from bhagavata deliver their respective dialogues the story thus moves in an interesting manner the narrative of the bhagavata is illustrated by the appropriate dialogues of the arthadharis who use only speech and not dancing or acting when the arthadharis donned costumes wore makeup got up from their seats and started acting and dancing the tal maddale form turned into a yakshagana as i told you but the pattern of the performance remained the same this is important that is singing of verses by the bhagavata and delivery of speeches by the actors or veshadharis taking cue from the bhagavata's songs the arthadharis had now become the veshadharis let us look a little closer the bhagavata along with his chorus is the first to come to the stage from the makeup room in a procession led by the musicians playing on their musical instruments the jester carries the idol of ganesha to the stage where he is worshiped many prayer songs dedicated to him and other deities are sung the purvaranga or pre drama preliminary contains items which include the bhagavata sabha lakshana vivechana the bhagavata first sings a song and the character performs a dance expressing the meaning of the songs this song sorry through gestures he then elaborates the meaning of the song through prose speech or dialogue the bhagavata then moves to other songs and the sequence is repeated all the well known composers of yakshagana have invariably been successful exponents also in the role of the bhagavata who is the very vital soul of yakshagana and if you search the internet you will come across the names and even pictures of many of these bhagavatas it is the bhagavata who moves the story prompts different characters to appropriate dances provides a befitting framework to the entire performance and motivates the rousing of a sentiment in addition he introduces the characters to the audience by asking them questions and also links up situations with his own commentary at the back of your mind if you have read hayavadan already then you will be able to correlate what with what i am saying he should have a close understanding of the epics and be equipped with a good voice and clear sense of the ragas of karnatak classical music but in yakshagana the ragas are slightly different from the typical carnatic classical music which we are familiar with 
Our Bhagavata would usually know by memory the entire text of 40 to 50 prabandhas or play texts which form his itinerary and would go on with the performance without referring to manuscripts. The Bhagavata recites a verse and presents a theme to the artist to elaborate with his own words and acting. The spoken word, therefore, is original and extempore. So he has to be a versatile genius if the Bhagavata needs to be a successful sutradhara or holder of the strings of the performance. Now, let us take a look at Karnad's interface with the Bhagavata. I'll refer to a few interviews. In an interview with Dr. Anjali Nerlekar, Karnad says this. And my great advantage was that I grew up in Sirsi, a place where there was no electricity till I was 14. I grew up in the midst of the Havyak community. Anyway, the great tradition among the Havyaks who are Brahmins, those days was the performing arts and theater. They did Yakshagana, they did plays. We all did plays endlessly. And at Basil Mission High School, where Karnat studied, they encouraged us a lot. The other thing is, because they are so oriented to literature, the literate Brahmins were particularly oriented towards Jaimini Bharata, since it was the center of Havyak culture. And because of this, I know my mythology perfectly. So I unquote there. Now, what is this Jaimini Bharata? It is a Kannada version of the Mahabharata written by Lakshmi Shah, a noted Kannada Brahmin writer who lived presumably during the mid 16th century. Lakshmi Shah is considered a successful storyteller with an ability to narrate the Upakyans or the stories within the stories, describing the physical beauty of a woman at length and to hold the reader in thrall with his rich Kannada diction and rhetoric. So the influence of Jaimini Bharata on Girish Karnad can be seen throughout his theatrical uh, creative writing ventures. So you see how Karnad was getting gradually drawn into this tradition of storytelling. In the same interview with Anjali Nerlekar, Karnad recollects his boyhood days and I quote, the day would come to an end at 8 o'clock. 8.30, we would all be asleep. When students met each other in class, they would tell each other stories since there was nothing else to do. Therefore, the brightest students among us prided themselves in collecting stories to be able to tell them in class the next day. This was my early life, unquote. And in this way, Karnad became an expert narrator who knew the tricks of engrossing his auditors. In another interview with Kirtinath Putkoti, published in Contemporary Indian Theatre, edited by Rajinder Paul, Karnad says to Putkoti, I quote, Now I am convinced that there is no difference between the theatre conventions of classical drama and those of folk drama. The principles that govern their dramatic aesthetics are the same. For example, the function of the Sutradhara is the same as that of the Bhagavata of a folk play. Unquote. By this time, Karnad had written the Kannada version of Yayati, which was his first play, as well as Hayavadana, which he had first written in Kannada and translated to English by this time. Yayati was translated much later. But Karnad points out in his interview with Tutun Mukherjee, I quote, in Hayavadana, the Bhagavata is not exactly like either the Sutradhara or the Bhagavata in traditional theater, unquote. So by the time he was writing Hayavadana, between Yayati and Hayavadana, there was Tughlaq. I have left Tughlaq out because uh, there is no function of the Bhagavata in Tughlaq. 
but by the time he was writing hayavadana he had already started experimenting with this character of the bhagavata kanat serious engagement with the indigenous traditions in the midst of which he grew up is probably because of the most important literary influence on him that of ak ramanujan the plays based on folklore like nagamandala and flaws draw directly from folk tales collected by ramanujan ramanujan's interest in folk tales and their anthropological significance attracted karnad towards his work in this area in his collected essays ramanujan pointed out that i quote folklore offers another alternative bounces off the so called high culture in systematic ways unquote therefore folk tales live out of the interior language and intimate relationships mythologies on the other hand belong to the larger public space and address social issues related to many so there are two ways in which theater can be approached in india and we know about this belonging to the loka or desi culture these folk tales of a counter systems anti structures sort of protest against the official or you can say mainstream or the powerful systems the storyteller in karnat immediately recognizes the powerful narrative elements in these folk tales which he adopted for his plays the energy of folk theater comes from the fact that while it seems to support traditional values it is also capable of subverting them and this act of subversion in most cases is done by the bhagavata himself looking at them these traditional values from various points of view so there is a multiple perspective which is introduced by the bhagavata and this actually engages the audience and makes them interested in the performance later on under the initiative of ramanujan karnad went to chicago university as fulbright scholar in residence where he wrote nagamandala for performance by the students of the university at the famous guthri theater festival now i come to the third phase of my discussion and we will take a quick look at karnad's use of the bhagavata as well as modified forms of the bhagavata in his plays uh for this um, i admit that i cannot resist from reading out to you the entire prologue of yayati karnad's first play although i will read from the english version which he had as i told you uh recreated much later with the published text uh which i have but it is back in midnapore i shall use the type script of yayati girish karnad had sent to me this type script has been modified in the published version but since i have the type script i will read out what is there in the type script and this is the prologue spoken by the sutradhara he enters and addresses the audience and this i think is an appropriate time because it is evening good evening i am the sutradhara which literally means the holder of strings it's been argued by some scholars that this title establishes my lineage back to the puppeteer the manipulator of marionettes but others equally respected have said the string being an instrument of measurement actually points to my descent from the carpenter the prop maker or the architect in effect i am the person who has conceived this structure i have designed the stage i have consecrated it and here i am now to introduce the performance and to ensure that it takes place without any problems our play this evening deals with an ancient myth but let me rush to explain it's not a mythological heaven forbid 
a mythological aims to plunge us into the sentiment of bhakti or devotion. It sets out to prove that the sole reason for our suffering in this world is that we have forgotten God, whoever it may be, Shiva, Vishnu, Durga, or one of their incarnations. We have become bereft of faith. The mythological is fiercely convinced that all suffering is merely a calculated test devised by the God to check out our willingness to submit to his or her will. If we crush our egos and give ourselves up in surrender, God's grace will descend upon us and redeem us. There are no deaths in mythological. A mythological must have a happy ending, if only to prove that there exists a God to organize it. There are no gods in our play, and it deals with death. A key element in its plot is the Sanjivani Vidya, the art of reviving the dead, which promises release from the confines of the fleeting life our self is trapped in. For the possession of this art, the gods and the Rakshasas have been killing each other from the beginning of time. However, it doesn't seem to have made much difference. Humans aspire to become immortal, but cannot achieve the lucidity necessary to understand eternity. Death eludes arrest. Time coils into a loop, reversing the order of youth and old age. Our certainties crumble in front of the stark demands of the heart. We turn to ancient myths, not because they offer any hope of consolation, but because they provide fleeting glimpses of the fears and desires sleepless within us. It's a good way to get introduced to ourselves. Take, for instance, the Greek myth of Oedipus. It has been held up as a cultural if not a universal archetype by psychoanalysts. It illustrates the unconscious antagonism a son harbors at an early stage of growth towards his father. The son desires his mother and seeks to destroy his father. What is fascinating is the shape this confrontation takes in Indian mythology. Here, it's the father who demands the surrender of the son's potency. Because Shantanu lusts for a woman, his son takes an oath never to sleep with a woman. In effect, the father castrates the son. Rama gives up his right to the throne and later loses his wife so that the word his father had given to his favorite wife can be fulfilled. Shiva decapitates his son who blocks his way to his wife, who at that moment happens to be bathing and later replaces the missing head with that of an elephant. What does this perplexing insistence on parental aggression say about us? Enough, however, of circumlocution. Let's get on with the play. This scene here represents an inner chamber on the first floor of Emperor Yayati's palace. The emperor's son, Crown Prince Puru, is returning home today after many years of absence. He has successfully completed his education in the hermitage of renowned gurus and is bringing home with him his bride, Chitralekha the princess of Anga. Crowds have started collecting in the grounds around the palace, eager to see the royal couple. The two must enter this space and on this bed, they must create for themselves the magic kingdom of love and power. He must sow his seed here and then launch forth on a campaign of victory and death. She must proudly bear on her breasts the tooth marks incised by their progeny, must. But nothing ever happens as it must. What we have spread out in front of us is not a map of royal routes, but a cobweb of unknown trails, beckoning enticingly, but twisting out of sight within a short distance. We have to choose a path. But are we sure we do the choosing? And if we are, why does a voice keep whispering in our ears? Shouldn't you have explored the other one? It seemed to head in the right direction. It was less thorny. It was more trodden. You can see that this is no path at all. What made you choose it? But we must trust the path we have chosen. In event, 
If one is necessary, we have to invent one and go on. We must live the oral tales handed down by our grandmothers. That's what our play is about. So that is a long delivery by the Sutradhara. He brings within his speech or monologue a lot of things, comments, information, side talk, and this draws the attention of the audience towards what, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he wants to say. Excuse me. This play is in three acts immediately following the prologue spoken by the Sutradhara. And it depicts abundantly what the Sutradhara has said in the prologue. It is clear that Kannad's personal experiences mingle in the voice of the Sutradhara, making his observations very apt for the contemporary urban audience's understanding. The next play in which the Bhagavata plays a significant role is Hayavadana which almost all of us have read. As I have already informed you, Kannad has himself pointed out that the Bhagavata in Hayavadana is different. In Kannad's Hayavadana, the Bhagavata is actually the Bhagavata and Vidushaka or Nata of Marga or and Desi theatre rolled into one. So in classical theatre, you have the Vidushaka in folk theatre, you have the Nata. And it seems that it is either the Vidushaka or the Nata, along with the classical role of the Bhagavata, rolled together to form the character of the Bhagavata in Hayavadana. Now, the jester is very dear to village audiences. And the jester as such does not appear in Hayavadana. His role has been divided between the actors the character of Hayavadana and partly the character of the Bhagavata. The gesture is shrewd, experienced and a keen observer of social and personal habits. They are all camouflaged behind a careful simplicity. The gesture never loses contact with the audience and they love this character. So this loved character is now split up between so many characters in Hayavadana. An excellent example of the Bhagavata's role as jester would be his comment, which immediately follows the Ganesha worship in the Purvaranga or the beginning of the play. And he says, May Vigneshwara, the destroyer of obstacles, who removes all hurdles and crowns, all endeavors with success, bless our performance now. How indeed can one hope to describe his glory in our poor, disabled words, an elephant said on a human body, a broken tusk and a cracked belly, whichever way you look at him, he seems the embodiment of imperfection, of incompleteness. How indeed can one fathom the mystery that this very Vakratunda Mahakaya with his crooked face and distorted body is the Lord and Master of success and perfection? Could it be? That this image of purity and holiness, this Mangala Murti, intends to signify by his very appearance that the completeness of God is something no poor mortal can comprehend. Be that as it may. It is not for us to understand this mystery or try to unravel it, nor is it within our powers to do so. Our duty is merely to pay homage to the elephant-headed God and get on with our play. So he has said all that he wanted to say. And after saying everything, he says, that's enough. Now let us get back to our play. So he has done the work of commenting on Godhead and questioning the role of Ganesha as the deity who will bless a performance with perfection where he himself is imperfection incarnate. The original Bhagavata would not have made these passing observations in such an open fashion. They would be left for the jester. So we see how Karnad has begun experimenting with the Bhagavata in Hayavadana. In this play, 
The Bhagavata tirelessly carries on the work of holding the mirror up to the foolish world, revealing its actual nature. His direct rapport with the audience makes the performance lively. He explains things to the audience, seeks their opinion, invites them to ponder over problems, seeking possible solutions. But by this time, Karnad's Hayavadana is a Yakshagana adopted for the urban proscenium stage. And yet, the Bhagavata is successful in establishing a rapport with the audience of this urban form of theatrical uh, architecture or theatrical uh, uh, performing space. He ex uh, uh, his interactions with Hayavadana, the character, add a different dimension to the play with a very intelligent angle added to the way in which contemporary social and political issues are commented on both by Hayavadana and the Bhagavata. In Hayavadana, therefore, it is the Bhagavata who makes the performance so lively. He is everywhere in the play. What happens in the next play, Nagamandala? There is no Bhagavata. But there is a prologue with the man, the flames who form the chorus, the song and the story. The play follows the technique of framing as in Hayavadana. And in the outer frame, there are the man, the flames, the story and the song. This frame serves the function of the Bhagavata. Since the characters in it have the essential features of the Bhagavata divided among them. The man who opens the performance is a playwright who has been directed by a mendicant to stay awake at least one whole night during the current month, failing which he will die. The man thought it a simple affair, but soon realized that it wasn't easy. This night of the performance is the last night of the month and the man has to stay awake if he has to live. When the men man asked the mendicant the reason for such a curse he was told by the mendicant you have written plays you have staged them you have caused so many good people who came trusting you to fall asleep twisted in miserable chairs so that is actually a comment on the uncomfortable chairs on which the audience have to sit while they watch a play in performance in urban spaces all that abused mass of sleep has turned against you and become the curse of death. Now, this is a severe comment on unsuccessful playwrights. Similarly, the flames gather in this abundant temple to exchange updates on the households to which they belong. Simply put, they are gossips. The story takes the shape of a pretty woman and the song becomes her sari. What better theatrical mechanism to represent a typically Indian cultural commonplace? What this story tells the flames who are eager to listen to her story is noteworthy. She says, but what is the point of your listening to a story? You can't pass it on. Therefore, narrating the story in an interesting manner is the most important element in a story. The man and the story, therefore, remain on stage throughout the rest of the play with the chorus of the flames a small distance away because the man has promised the story that he will see to it that the story is propagated to many others. And therefore, the story unfolds and the story is that of Rani and Upanna. I may digress here to refer to an excellent production of the play by Baliganj Shapno Shuchana, directed by Obonti Chakraborty, featuring Turnadas as Rani and the Midnapore boy Onirban Bhattacharya as Apanna. And Onirban Bhattacharya was excellent as Apanna. In this production, the roles of the man and the story as narrators have been excellently depicted. And Karnad had seen the performance during the Karnad festival in Ranga Shankara 
and he was extremely pleased with it. Next, we turn to The Fire and the Rain. It has a prologue too, in which an appeal is being made to the king by the priests performing a seven-year fire sacrifice to bring rains to the drought-ridden land for allowing a troop of actors to perform a play. Plays which were frequently performed in the past have been banned from the site of the Yagna when this play opens. The actor manager is allowed to come and make, he makes a theatrical declamation when the king allows him to speak. And this is what the actor manager, who is also the Bhagavata, says. Sirs, as is well known to you, Brahma, the lord of all creation, extracted the requisite elements from the four Vedas and combined them into a fifth Veda and thus gave birth to the art of drama. He handed it over to his son, Lord Indra, the god of the skies. Lord Indra, in turn, passed on the arts to Bharata, a human being, for the gods cannot indulge in pretense. So, if Indra is to be pleased and bring an end to this long drought which ravages our land, a fire sacrifice is not enough. A play has to be performed along with it. If we offer him entertainment in addition to the oblations, the gods may grant us the rains we are praying for. So the actor manager is coaxing the king to permit the performance of a play. So that is yet another role that the Bhagavata performs. He has to make sure that a performance is made possible. The actor manager, who is the Bhagavata, therefore, takes these initiatives towards play form of performance. Then there was a long gap because Karnad went back to a heap of broken images, then wedding album, boiled beans on toasts, and then came his last play, Crossing to Talikota, after a long time, where again we have a prologue. But in this play, published last year, posthumously, there is a prologue which is very different and it's very difficult to trace the Bhagavata directly present in this play because he is not there. The prologue creates the atmosphere for the play by depicting the fallout of the havoc raised on the glorious city of Vijayanagara as a result of an overnight defeat in the Battle of Talikota. Beginning with the commoners, how they carve their own means of sustenance during these times of destruction and dismay, the prologue leads to the life and career of Aliya Ramaraya. By this time, therefore, Karnad has found out the role of the Bhagavata and internalized it in the layout of the plot because the prologue and i don't want to uh, read it out in detail actually creates the atmosphere for the performance of what happens that leads to the battle at talikota so by way of conclusion i shall say that girish karnad had been profoundly influenced by the tradition of the bhagavata an actor, singer, narrator, manager, right from his boyhood days in Sivsi. And with the influence and inspiration of A.K. Ramanujan from his college days onwards, he amply used and experimented with the Bhagavata and his function in theatrical performance. As a result, the Bhagavata's function remains the same, although he gradually goes behind the many characters Karnad creates for performing his function in theatrical space. I would say that in doing this, Karnad has moved away from the cliched use of the Bhagavata in folk performances towards accommodating him in the urban elite theatrical space. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for such a wonderful academic discourse. Uh, it has been a pleasure to listen to you. And uh, now I think uh, it's time for taking questions.
over to you professor tanmay Professor Tanmay, are you there? Yes, uh, I'm very much there. So we invite questions from the participants. So they can see all that in the on the screen. Uh, we have a banner. They have their questions in the comment section of YouTube. Then I will make it visible to man. Man can see them on our screen. Yes, uh, ma'am, uh, I'm make it, making it visible to your screen. You can, yes, please. Uh, yes. All right. What is the difference between Karnat's style of writing and other Indian playwrights? The difference between Karnat's style of writing and other Indian playwrights. Karnat, first of all, uh, style of writing uh, would uh, imply a lot of things. If you talk about language, then of course, his English has a lot of uh, the typical vernacular influence of Kannada uh, in the way in which he personally speaks and writes his plays. There is that influence. If you talk about theatrical uh, composition, then of course, uh, in his plays, there are a lot of other elements. He takes the traditional, he takes the, uh, the classical, the folk, and he makes it valid for a contemporary audience, which is urban. And he also, for his English plays, keeps an international audience in mind. Uh, say, for instance, the play Bali the Sacrifice was uh, for the London Haymarket Theatre, and it had a mixed caste and international caste. So he keeps all this in mind. That is there, which makes his plays so uh, viable and so popular compared to the other Indian playwrights. Say, uh, for instance, those who are writing plays now, uh, I would say that uh, uh, Karnad would be at least one step ahead of them. And he has been very scathing in his remarks about other playwrights, which I do not wish to refer to here. But you can uh, look up his interviews in different uh, places in the YouTube or uh, interviews published in the hard uh, copy form. And you will see how he has been very pertinent in his remarks because he says that a play, after all, is something which is meant for performance and it has to attract an audience. That is what. Uh, has been said by the mendicant to the failed playwright in uh, Nagamandala. So that is another comment which Girish Karnad is making, actually. So that itself shows how uh, he is very particular about uh, the, if you call it the style within quotes, then of course it is the way in which uh, a play communicates. So language and narrative about which I have been speaking. Uh, why do you think, despite having such command in creatively using folk elements, Karnad did not experiment much with theatrical spaces, remained rooted in proscenium urban space? Uh, that, I think, is precisely because he wanted to uh, allow people to act his plays in such a space. Although he was uh, a great admirer of Badul Sharkar, whose Ebong Indraji in, he had translated. and But that translation was from the Hindi made by Pratibha Ji, Pratibha Agarwal. So he, he did appreciate uh, other theatrical spaces. In fact, Ranga Shankara, the theater house itself, has space for 
the proscenium, which is not typically proscenium, if the seating space for the audience is semicircular, somewhat like the uh, ancient Greek uh, uh, way of seating. And there is an open air theater space too in Ranga Shankara. So it wasn't that he wasn't aware, but he didn't personally use them. Can you refer to Karnad as a feminist playwright? If not, then why? Uh, well, about feminism, that would be another lecture. But uh, in brief, just to go back again to the roots, Karnad's mother was a very assertive lady. She died at a very old age. And she was, uh, she was uh, very, very active. And she always told her children that they should be active. And uh, she was a widow with a son. And she remarried Karnad's father, uh, Dr. Uh, Raghunath Karnad. And uh, she told Karnad later on that uh, uh, Karnad's father wouldn't have married her if she hadn't insisted that he marry her. So she was that kind of a woman. And she influenced her son to uh, such an extent that Karnad had a tremendous respect for women. And uh, it wasn't typically feminist in the way, but he felt that women were also human beings and they ought to be treated as such and not as if they were the other sex. So uh, I will not say that he was that sort of a feminist, but you will find if you read his plays that all the women in his place have been accorded respectful space by Karnad, uh, including, I will say, in crossing to Talikota, the characters of um, Satyabhama, Ramaraya's wife, and uh, Begum Humayun Sultana, the Nizam Shah's wife, who plays a key role behind the battle of Talikota. And all this has been brought out by Karnad very effectively. So if you want to call him a feminist, I don't know whether he would agree to it. But of course, as far as women are concerned, patriarchal domination was the last thing he had in his mind. And that applies to his personal life as well. So ma'am, uh, two more questions we will take. Uh, it's from Sitoma Roy. Okay. Can we compare the use of the snake symbol in Naga Mandala with Indian mythological concept of Ouroboros? Okay. Um, what Karnad did for Naga Mandala uh, was that he took the idea of Naga Mandala from the Naga Mandala worship and dance, which again is a very common folk practice in Karnataka. Now, about Ouroboros, I am not certain. That is for the critic to find uh, meaning and interpretation. If one can establish this idea, then it's fine. But as far as Karnad is concerned, he had gone back to two things. One is the very common shape shifting in mythology and in folk narratives of uh, snakes taking the form of human beings to uh, interfere in household life by way of a fertility symbol. That is one aspect which Karnad incorporates into Naga Mandala. The other is the Naga worship, the Naga dance, and the creation of a Naga Mandala specifically as a fertility rite, so that those participating in this would be blessed with offspring progeny, particularly the women. That is the idea there. Now, for Ouroboros, frankly, I am not certain. Pooja Radha Krishnan, did Karnad give justice to Indian mythology in his mythological dramas? Karnad himself had said, to me that um, he uses the epics 
for his sources but ma nishada is one play which he had done in kannada uh, on the ramayana uh, epic and he did not appreciate it so he did not translate it to english he was more fond of the mahabharata particularly because i told you he was influenced by the mahabharata narratives in the yakshagana and because the mahabharata with its main story and its digressions is a storehouse of interventions enquiries into human life human nature human behavior and the ways in which people do act and can act so he finds the mahabharata a much better proposition for uh, going back to as source for his uh, plays so he has yayati based on the mahabharata he has the fire and the rain based on the mahabharata stories ma'am thank you so we have i end uh, this introduction session now over to you shongita ma'am yes sir uh, now as we are towards the, the end of our session uh, i would like to request pusta mukherji one of our uh, students from the department of english minnapur college to please uh, give the formal vote of thanks over to you pusta hello sir am i audible sir yes you are audible hello okay good evening every Good evening, everyone. I, Kosto Mukherjee, student of UG Fourth Sem, on behalf of the Department of English, Midnapur College Autonomous, would like to thank Dr. Jolly Das, ma'am, for enlightening us with such a wonderful presentation. I would also like to thank our respected principal, sir, Dr. Gopal Chandra Vera, for giving the permission to arrange such online lecture series. I would also like to. convey my gratitude to our respected professor tanmay kundu sir and professor sangeeta sangeeta konar ma'am for arranging this lecture series and making our lockdown just really meaningful and enjoyable and last but not the least i want to thank all the participants across india that they have invested their time to listen to this lecture series thank you to everyone out there stay safe thank you thank you sir. so thank you kostak